la suite Could you speak to the um, the crosses that are showing on the stars? Do they um, do you capture those? Or that's a that's a really good question. Everyone heard the the cross pattern you see on the stars that isn't added by me, and you'll see this effect on most professional large telescope images because the secondary mirror of the telescope, these are reflectors, is held in place by four veins or struts of some sort. And as the light passes by them to the primary mirror, it diffracts the light. So it's a diffraction pattern. If you're using a, a telescope that doesn't have mirrors and it's just a big uh, refractor, then you don't have the diffraction pattern. You would kind of see glows around the stars. But uh, reflect. this is a giveaway that you're using a, a reflecting big telescope of some sort. Yeah, so I don't add it. Now what was nice, one of the things that I did do is that this composition I chose. Right? The, uh, the object on the sky is not oriented in this nice up and down direction. So maybe it's a little more compelling if you display it this way with everything being like that. But yeah, that's a choice. Funny you should mention HDR. I was just playing this morning with the new Lightroom CC that added HDR. Yeah. Now I've been playing with HDR for a while. But the way we do it in normal landscape photography, you right. know, like take three to five pictures and then use an HDR program to make them one and then adjust from there. How do you do that with your HDR? Uh, because the dynamic range of these images is 16 bits, those curves that I mentioned, the, like the digital development curves, do a lot of the work you in general don't need to take different exposures at different times unless you reach a limit uh, of the camera. There are certain things that are so bright, like the Orion Nebula, that saturate no matter how short your exposure is. So you do it as short as you can, and then you also do a long exposure. Those you can blend together like what is done with HDR. But otherwise, most of the work that is done in astrophotography, you end up using these nonlinear curves instead of somehow combining multiple exposures at different uh, densities. Yeah, so it's a little bit different, but it is an interesting way to do it um, in, uh, in landscape photography, you know, regular photography. Yeah? Um, you mentioned that you had reviewed the Canon, uh, sorry. Yeah, it was a 60D. The, the 60D that yeah. you'd reviewed that. Is that something that you use in your work as well, or do you s just use the large telescope CCD images? The, the camera that I use is more sensitive than a regular digital camera mm -hmm. because you can cool the chip, and that extra sensitivity is vital if you want to be able to create a picture like this. So, th I mean, the, those digital cameras are great, um, and they're a less expensive way to kind of get into astrophotography. But ultimately, the quantum efficiency, the sensitivity of the, the camera becomes very important if you want to try to detect dim things. For bright things, um, even a regular DSLR camera is wonderful, not only for just taking pictures and star trails in the night sky, uh, but many, many bright things through a telescope. So it's one of the avenues that amateur astronomers tend to travel when they uh, begin astrophotography on their own with a telescope. But ultimately, you, you end up buying the, uh, the cooled cameras, because uh, they are better. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so you are... I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so you are an astrophotographer, and uh, how much of what you do has to do with science, and how much with the art of photography itself? I think I, I have a mix of both. I'm trying to be a popularizer of astronomy through the public outreach that I do. That isn't science, although you might say that there is a science involved in communicating science and astronomy to people. So in that sense, that's a little bit different, right? Um, in terms of research, one of the things that we do with the telescope is that it's used for people to look through, and then after they leave, because it's only a a uh, certain number of hours in the evening that we use the telescope for the public programs. They go, and the telescope is used for the rest of the night, and it's used by either amateur astronomers or professionals 
um, if they wanted time on it, to do whatever they want. We programmed the telescope to do our evil bidding in order to collect scientific data. So the telescope is used in that way, and in some sense I am a scientist because I need to make sure that the data is of good quality. And uh, sometimes I even do my own bit when I'm collecting data for various reasons. Um, a couple of years, is it a couple of years now? Probably a couple of years ago, I even discovered a supernova, uh, a star that blew up in another galaxy because I was doing my you know, work in astrophotography, but my background is astronomy, and when I see a little star blow up in a galaxy, that interests me. So um, I'm also a scientist in that sense. The other thing that I would say about the pictures is I'm using them in a very special way. Um, as part of public outreach, you know, I can only do these kinds of things for as far as my voice will carry. But these images have much greater reach because once published, they can be seen by people around the world. And so I use the imagery as an astronomer, astrophotographer, whatever that hybrid thing is, to do popularization of astronomy. How long did it take you to get to this level of art slash science? I don't know if it's art, but I'll tell you whatever it is. Um, when I started the programs at uh, developing the programs at Kitt Peak, uh, I had the idea that I'd like to invite people to stay the entire night and be treated like a visiting astronomer. And what that meant was that we would put a camera to the telescope and take pictures. That's where I learned. Um, now the weird thing is that I learned how to do it with people looking over my shoulder the entire time. And when I began, I wasn't as proficient as I am now. So it's interesting to look back at what I was doing in the, you know, the mid-90s, late 90s, to what I kind of do today. But it's through brute force of practice over many, many thousands of nights and years of time. And who's your teacher now? Who's my teacher? teacher. Who do you go to for advice? Anybody? <laughs> I, will t I will put it like this. There is a community of astrophotographers. Uh, we go to conferences and we attend similar kinds of events. You email one another. So within that community of people, uh, there are you know, certain problems that we might have or things that we might want to do. And within that community, I'm certainly uh, involved. Oh, Dean, I'm scared. <laughs> Dean has a question. <laughs> no, Adam, I just wanted to ask, uh, how has your uh, workflow changed in the last 15 years? You know, uh, that's well, you, you, you look at your past glories, uh, yes. how would you approach things these days compared to back then? That's a great question. One of the interesting things about astrophotography is that the software of it has become considerably more sophisticated. And uh, one of the things that I can do nowadays is script some of the tedium, tedious stuff out of the process so I can get to the more artistic things that you know, really make the astrophotographs what they are. So it used to be that a good fraction of the time was spent just processing and dealing with the calibration of the data uh, one of the things that I used to do at Kitt Peak, and people would be falling asleep behind me while I did it, was to remove by hand cosmic rays. There's these little, uh, we get these high energy particles coming to us from space. They run into the atoms of the upper atmosphere, and they rain down on us to be detected by the chip. And they are within the pictures. So when you take different pictures in different colors, you get this confetti of cosmic rays in your images. So how do you get rid of them? Well, you go with a little clone tool, and for every single one, you would get rid of it. It takes forever. And then people were very concerned about this because they thought I might erase a galaxy or something. <laughs> well, you know, if there's anyone in the world that would not, you know, clobber a galaxy, it's got to be me. But nowadays, with software, you can do a lot of that kind of boring stuff much more easily, sophisticated algorithms and scripting and do much more of the artistic things. So my workflow has now changed to be, uh, to allow me to spend more time on making these decisions that make the images, I think, more compelling. 
No, no, all, all of the pictures that you saw that I took were all taken at the Mount Lemmon Sky Center using the telescope up there and the camera that I use. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you mentioned about washing uh, people who have never seen the Milky Way before. Um, are you at all concerned with the uh, kind of washing that it can occur when a person loses their sense of wonder from within? And I'm talking now about visual things now. I'm, I'm restricting myself to that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I will tell you that one of the things that I try to do as part of my programs is to ignite, if it hasn't been within them before, somewhat of that awareness or inspiration that people might get from the natural world around us. Um, one of the interesting things is that some visitors come to the program and not everyone in a group, in a family for example, might be interested in looking through the telescope. You know, well, that, that doesn't, that's sort of for nerds, that's for geeky people, you know, right? But by the end of the program, what you find is that people tell us, you know, I didn't expect that that was going to be so, you know, enjoyable, entertaining, and inspirational. So, though you might wonder if people are going to become so jaded that they'll never, uh, you know, have that interest in the night sky or in this natural resource, um, I do find again that it, there is something innate within us, and with the right sparking, ignition, um, you can reignite some of that wonder. One of, one of the most uh, important books, actually, it's so just short writing, actually, uh, that I've ever read on this subject is The Sense of Wonder by Rachel Carson. Okay. It was first appeared publicly in 1955. Okay, we'll do one more question. <laughs> I know nothing about what you're talking about, but I have a question. <laughs> well, I have a question. If I was to take a picture of the Hubble telescope, yes. the same thing you took a picture yes. of, would it look the same? No. <laughs> it would not look the same for a number of reasons, in the sense that the Hubble Space Telescope image would be a much smaller field of view, so it would only be a fraction of something I took a picture of, because I can see a larger patch of sky. It wouldn't be a full color representation like the blending that we do with our eyes. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have that kind of naturalness view that we associate with full color images. And um, it would be much, much better than anything I could do in terms of resolution. Because being above the Earth's atmosphere, there isn't the blurring due to the, Earth, um, the Earth's atmosphere. You don't blur the images. And you're limited only by the size of your telescope. So. One of the other differences that might be interesting to know is that, you know, we have restricted ourselves in this talk to be talking about visible wavelengths of light, but space-based telescopes can do much more. They can look in these other wavelengths of light from radio and infrared right on up to UV, which is not accessible to us from the ground. So a picture from Hubble may not look like any of my pictures because they're not even looking in the same wavelengths of light. So many different reasons it may look different but it's for scientific value, not for aesthetic appeal, that the Hubble does its job. All right. Well, you know, I spent four years in art school, and I think I learned more about Photoshop tonight. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> We have a table set up outside the auditorium where Adam will be selling prints, postcards, and books, and he'll be signing them. So definitely, definitely stick around for that and take a look in the galleries. And thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.